Thank you for your prayers tonight. I'm very much edified with the range of ages that pray and their uh, insights. Most excellent. <coughs> We're continuing this series of messages on the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. That is, in the miracles of Jesus, you have a sort of an index to the kingdom of God. It tells you what, uh, what Jesus is doing. The miracles themselves are not the, not the point. It's what they, what they reveal that is the point. As Jesus said when he healed a certain paralytic, that you may know that the Son of Man hath power to forgive sins. Then he bid the man to stand up and walk. So it was, see, it was what it made known. It was the, it was the real point. Satan is capable of working lying signs and wonders. Lying signs and wonders does not mean that, that the signs and wonders aren't real. In the, in the, according to sight, when Satan uh, caused a wind to cause uh, the house to fall down upon all of Job's children, that was a, that was a real wind. Yeah. And when he caused fire to come down out of heaven and consume some of Job's livestock, that was that was a real fire. Mm -hmm. Those are real boils that Job had. Mm -hmm. So people who think that what Satan does isn't real in the realm of nature, <laughs> these people that Jesus bound, that Satan bound in the Scripture, the woman bowed over with a she was really bowed over. And the, the fever Peter's mother-in-law had was a real fever. So see, the lying signs and wonders does not mean they're not real in the realm of nature. It means that they point in the wrong direction right. and they are not wrought in truth. When Jesus came to his hometown and he first opened up his ministry, <laughs> he delivered his, what you might call his manifesto. He told what he was going to do. Now I'm going to read this from Luke 4, 18 and 19 because I, I want to keep before you that all of Christ's miracles fit into this declaration. And here's what he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind uh, to preach that. I want, don't want you to miss to preach that. And recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now that's what Jesus came to do and in his miracles he was doing that. Doing that. Now tonight we're going to focus on uh, kind of a broad, broad declaration of miracles in uh, the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, where it just says he healed many that were possessed of demons. Again, I want to fit that into what Jesus came to do. Mm -hmm. Acts, the 10th chapter, and verse 38, gives another kind of overview of Christ's ministry. It says he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. This, this is going to fit in that, that category. <clears throat> Here's something else you want to remember when we're talking about Christ's uh, ministry. That God was approving, this is Acts 2.22, God was approving of Christ, approving him by miracles and wonders and signs. So the objective of these great miracles was not just merely to ease the burden to the people that, that were recipients of them. That God was approving of Christ in this. No one had ever done what he was doing before. Because he was bringing a message nobody had ever proclaimed before. <coughs> and one other matter, that in all of these Christ himself was unrecognized. You may see Christ in all of these things, but he was not the people... They didn't see the significance of this. So the miracles of Jesus actually are doing more now mm -hmm. than they did then. Amen. All these miracles that Jesus did, you wonder, so where were these people on the day of Pentecost? What happened to all these people? And there was 120 
gathered together, where were all these people? One time he fed 5,000 men beside women and children. That could have been as high as 20, 25,000 people if, they, if the proportion of women and children and men are the same as they are today. Another time he fed 4,000. Where, where were these people? What I'm showing you here is that there was a high purpose for these miracles. It was to convince people of who Christ was. Now, a lot of people in that day weren't convinced. We want to make it our business to be convinced. In fact, the scripture says that if they had known who Jesus was, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So it may very well have been some of these very people that experienced this were in that crowd that was stirred up by the chief priests to cry, crucify him. Now the text we're dealing with tonight is Matthew 8, 16 and Luke 4, 41, both referring to the same time. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Luke 4.41 And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, <coughs> suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Mm. Mm. Quite, a, <laughs> quite a picture, isn't it? <clears throat> I want to say a few introductory words about demons. The word, King James word devils is, is, is the demons we're talking about. It's translated demons in most, most of the other versions. The older word is translated devil to associate it, these spirits, these are spirits, to associate these spirits with, with the Satan. They're, he's sort of their prince. So that's why they referred to them as devils in the older English. Now, demons are, are not mentioned frequently before Christ, but they are mentioned. Devils or demons, or as I'm going to establish, the evil spirits are like synonymous. I'm going to show that this is the case. During the time of the law, there was a little set of them. Now the people, if you were ever in the Middle East part of the world, they're very conscious about demons and evil spirits. Mm -hmm. In our country, there's a, there's a few people that are very conscious of the presence of these, mm -hmm. of these uh, spirits that are wicked and corrupt. They're personalities. They're not people like we are, but they're personalities, that, and they're intelligent. And they're rational, and they, they are persuasive, and they have powers that supersede human powers. They can bind a person with a disease, or with ignorance, or spiritual blindness. It's a whole array. How many of these there are, we have no idea. But if Jesus hadn't uh, put the clamps on them when he died, <laughs> they'd have continued to run roughshod over the world. Mm -hmm and bind it. Whole sections of the world were, were held for hundreds and some thousands of years held captive by this domain of, mm -hmm. of demons. Leviticus 17.7 makes just a, just a passing reference, but this is quoted in the New, New Testament Scriptures also. They shall no more offer their sacrifices unto <coughs> devils after whom they have gone a-whoring. So you learn a little something about demons here. Demons solicit mm -hmm. the service of humanity. They can draw people aside after them. These people thought they were worshiping gods like Baal and you know, idols. But they were really demons were behind them. Deuteronomy 32, 17 says much the same thing. They sacrificed unto devils. And not to God. And none of these people would have said they were doing this. But, but they were. Second Chronicles 11.15 One of the kings, he ordained them priests for the high places and for devils. So they had here a whole separate religious hierarchy that served demons. That's what they did. 
Again, they didn't say they were doing this, but see, God's telling you, this is really what was happening, that behind idolatry, there are very real personalities. When you see that fat little Buddha sitting up there, there's a very real spirit that's behind that. That's right. That's just not a piece of stone. Mm -hmm. Something behind that that's animating people to worship that, that spirit. Psalm 106, verse 37. The Leviticus and Deuteronomy text is quoted hundreds of years later by, by the psalmist. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils or demons. Why? See, what would move a person? To do knew that, to see that Manasseh taught people to burn their children mm -hmm. in sacrificed idols. Well, I'd never do that. Well, you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you right now, if God didn't restrain you, you'd do it too. Amen. These spirits are this potent. I tell you, if people knew the type of world, dark world, that's aligned against them, mm -hmm. they would run to Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes, they actually did to offer their children. First Corinthians 10, 20, Paul brings up this matter of sacrificing to, to demons or devils. I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And listen to what he says. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Demons. Say, well, can a person really fell fellowship with demons? Yeah. Oh, yes. person can. See, if a person is not fleeing to Christ for refuge, this is one of the options. It's open. Uh -huh. Serving devils. Uh -huh. Now, devils or demons are also called evil spirits. Now, I want to establish that this speaking about the same, about the same thing. <clears throat> Here's an instance in the 19th chapter of Acts. First, verse 12 says concerning Paul, from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and diseases departed out of them and the evil spirits <coughs> went out of them. The next verse tells us about certain men who were exorcists who cast out demons out of possessed people. Certain of the vagabond Jews' exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul speaketh, which whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. But who are you? I mean, these are intelligent. <laughs> these are intelligent. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on him, on them, and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So you learn from this, uh, these uh, spirits, evil spirits, Demons have a phenomenal power. They can impart power to humans so one person can overcome seven others. These seven men leaped on them and they went naked and bruised and wounded. It was an intelligence spirit who knew who Jesus was, knew who Paul was. Paul had invaded the territory of these spirits. Again, I want to establish that evil spirits and demons are the same thing. Luke, the 8th chapter, verse 2. Certain women, which had made, had, he had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, these women that ministered to Jesus, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Luke, or Mark 16, 9 says the same thing. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first unto Mary, out of whom he had cast seven <coughs> devils. I notice in chapter Luke 8 it says he healed them of evil spirits. Mm -hmm. Then he mentions Mary Magdalene, seven <coughs> demons. Mm -hmm. so there's evil spirits, demons. They're the, 
Same thing. Mark 1, 23. There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, let us alone, Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's Mark 1, 23. Matthew 10, 1. Or uh, uh, Mark 1.23 says there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Luke 4.23 says he was an unclean devil or demon. It's the same, same thing. Matthew 10.1 Jesus sent out his twelve disciples. He gave them power over unclean spirits. Mark 3.15 says he gave them power to heal sicknesses and cast out devils. He's, he's talking about this. About the same thing. Luke 10, 17 said, The seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, or demons, are subject to us through thy name. Jesus answered in verse 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you. You see, these are just a whole host of spirits, uh, vast in number. We have no idea how many they are. But they have power over people and power to delude and power to bind. People could just see behind the scenes. <laughs> you see the need for the Lord for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now some of these evil spirits existed back in the days of the very primitive spiritual days. Jude 9.23 says that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. What? Why did it, these men of men of Shechem? You say, well, why? Why did these men of Shechem? Why were they so tough on Abimelech? Well, an evil spirit, one of these uh -huh. demons, stirred them up. Well, I, I, now you know what <coughs> one of the reasons for friction among people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and why trouble arises. First Samuel sixteen fourteen said, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul in an evil spirit. From the Lord troubled him. Verse 23 of 1 Samuel 16 says it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul. Then David took a harp and played with his hand so that Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. How could this be? Someone says that this evil spirit was from God. Mm -hmm. Well evil spirits just can't go out at will. Mm -hmm. This whole underworld is under the government of God. Mm -hmm. And if the people if people aren't interested in God, if they aren't interested in our time in Christ, they're subject to God and his will can send these. Well Paul said he'll send strong delusion Amen. that they should believe a lie. Where where these delusions come from? These demons. Once again, I say that people who insist on doing things themselves and standing by their own mind and their own abilities must see this, uh, this dreadful horde of evil spirits. Now they're intelligent. I want the accent to hear this. They're intelligent mm -hmm. spirits. The, uh, here, let me give you an example. Jesus spoke of a spirit that had the intelligence to assess a situation and do something about it. Here's his, here's his, his, his uh, record. Matthew 12, 43. The unclean spirit, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. It's intelligent activity. And finds none. And he saith, I will return to my house. Notice this. From whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. But when nobody was living in it. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man's worse than the first. Even so shall it also be under this generation. So why does a generation deteriorate? Hmm? Why is it that some of us in a gap of 30, 40, 50 years have seen a generation just go, go, go down the tubes, so to speak? Yeah. What caused that? This is what caused that. Yeah. 
There's a foe that can assess the situation. See, there's nothing here. There's nothing of substance here. Here's a person here that's cleaned up their life, but there's nothing in it. Let's go back in and invade the territory again. See, that's irrational. It's just, the Satan's hosts know how to plot war. Mm -hmm. they know how to, we may not be able to tell if Christ is in a person or not, but these spirits can tell, mm -hmm. I'll tell you. Never play with God. <clears throat> now let's take a look at some more instances here. Here's Mark 1.34. These are intelligent. He healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered them not to speak, not, suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. That's intelligent. You don't want these demons to outstrip you. If you don't know Christ, you can't just know Christ by books, by training. Got to re they recognize him. They knew when someone turned up that was from heaven, these spirits know. Yeah. Here again, Mark 3, 11. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him, crying, saying, Thou art the Son of God. See, they knew. They knew. Mark 5, 2. When he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This man runs, the scripture says he ran. When he saw Jesus afar so off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. Let's see, these are words of intelligent, intelligent foes. I mention these because see, these are the foes we're wrestling against. These are yeah. some of these that we're wrestling against. <clears throat> now, I was going to see if, if some more, if more of these instances. Mark 1 27. We're going to see here that they're obedient. Demons don't argue with Jesus, <laughs> demons don't uh, resist Jesus. <laughs> Mark 1, 27, they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commanded even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Yes, amen. Do you not know that in the day of judgment, when all humanity stands before God and there are people who didn't obey Jesus, mm -hmm. they may have offered all manner of excuse why they didn't, but there's not going to be a demon, not Satan, that will be able to say, we didn't obey him. They all obeyed him. When he said, leave, they left. When he said, don't speak, they didn't speak. Would you like to be among a group of people that was beneath demons and their response to Christ? They're intelligent. You have to be intelligent to obey. You can't obey just mechanically. You obey because you see something. Mm -hmm. These demons see who Jesus is. And they respect his words. So if you can get Jesus to speak mm -hmm. to these spirits in your behalf, <laughs> that terminates their dominion. Amen. Now here's another view of them in 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils yeah. or demons. So Satan in this age of spiritual illumination, when life and immortality has been brought to light by the gospel, and things aren't crude like they were in former years, people just bash your head in if you didn't agree, mm -hmm. see? We're, we're living in a little more refined times now than times, uh, historical times. That, sort of boggle your mind when you read about the violence and so forth that existed. So Satan has, so to speak, adjusted his tactics here. Uh -huh. He, he likes to have colleges and schools and theological systems of thought and doctrines that are very well thought out. Huh? He can seduce people made in the image of God. He can seduce them. 
In fact, the, the demons believe there's one God. Men may debate about this, but, mm -hmm. but they don't. James 2.19, Thou believest there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They don't believe because of testimony. They believe because they were there. <laughs> they, they were in his presence. They know who it is. See, we believe by testimony. That's, that's not how they believe. They, they, they tremble. They tremble. Can you imagine what a shakeup it was when Jesus came in the flesh, when God was made manifest in the flesh and a man strode through Galilee that was, that was filled with God, had the mind of God and the nature of God. This shook up. Satan's empire when he came. So they fear God and tremble. And demons can set a table for you. They can make a place for you to eat. It's more like a pig trough than it is a banquet table, but they do this. And here's what the scriptures say about it. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Uh -huh. or demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils or demons. So here's a table we we sit at. The, the demons have one too. You sit and you learn more about their empire. You learn more about darkness and you're filled more with the spirit of the wicked one. They have. They can set this out. In fact, this is my candid opinion Many of the fads and fashions that are facing us today are actually the table of demons. Mm -hmm. It's something Satan has set out. If we've got a whole generation that's just drinking it in, just mm -hmm. drinking it in. And it's making them violent, it's making them ignorant, it's making them rude, it's making them crude. Why? They're eating at the devil's table. Mm -hmm. That's why. I'm showing here that these are intelligent personalities. <clears throat> And we learn something else in Scripture. We learn that they they prefer to dwell in bodies. They just don't want to be spirits floating like floating about in the air. It's not that sort of thing. Matthew the 8th chapter, this is the case of the Gadarene demoniac that dwelt in tombs, you remember? They chained him up and he just broke him. He was like strong like Samson, except it wasn't with the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of the wicked one. Superhuman. Matthew 8, 30. Jesus has just told these demons, they said their name, they had a spokesman, spoke out of this man's mouth, this poor man's mouth, and he said, what's your name? He said, Legion. Legion, which means that a lot of us here, in one body, one human body. And, and, there, and he told them they had to leave. There was a good way off from them. This is them, the demons that are in this man. A herd of many swine feeding. So the demons, or devils, besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into that herd of swine. 2,000. 2,000 of those swine ran violently off, off a cliff. <laughs> committed swine suicide, so to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These 2,000, oh, two I don't know if it was one demon per swine, I have no idea, but it was a lot of demons in one person. They found a person they could reside in. The person that was made in the image of God it made him like a wild man. And when they entered into swine, it, like the swine didn't want to live anymore. They rushed like a herd over, over a cliff and drowned in the sea. These are the hosts now that if Jesus hadn't have come, we'd all been subject to these That's right. these type of spirits. And there's considerable said in Scripture how they possess people. Now I don't know now what I don't know <coughs> now what the free will advocates do with this. I'm going to make a bold assertion. I'm going to say if there is such a thing as free will, man cannot be possessed. Yeah. I think I could support this. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it. I'm just going to be in general. <laughs> but you don't, you don't want to try and disprove this. Can we just dig a hole and bury a person for us? If your will is free, you cannot be possessed by somebody else. 
We got it in scripture that here's this verse that possessed, they owned people. They owned them. Possessed them. All right, let's read some of these texts. Matthew 4, 24. His fa Jesus' fame went throughout all Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and those that were possessed. Possessed with demons, devils. Matthew 8, 16. Different set of circumstances. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils or demons. And he cast out the spirits. Notice that they were called demons, and then they're called spirits. All right. It's the same, same class. And he cast them out with his word. So <laughs> Jesus didn't like wrestle these people down to the ground. Matthew 8, 28, same. It's a different set of circumstances. When he was coming to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, they made him too possessed with devils coming out of the tomb. So one gospel writer says there was one. This one says there's two. <coughs> Matthew 9, 32 is another instance. There, and as they went out, behold, they brought unto him a dumb man possessed with a devil or demon. So the de demon had possession of him, owned him. His will wasn't free, nothing else was free either. Yeah. Matthew 12, 32. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh the word against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, what would move a person to do something like that? That's some of these evil spirits. You may say, I would never speak a word against God. <laughs> You're outside of Christ. You would speak a word against God. Compelled by these. Well, let's go after Jesus died. What about these unclean spirits after Jesus died? Some people would say, well, after Jesus died, they just there weren't these unclean spirits or demons anymore. Well, here's after Jesus died, considerable time after Jesus died, Acts 8, 7. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed, that were possessed with them. How about that? Acts 16, 16. It came to pass that he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed of a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain to soothsaying. I will go so far as to say here that those in Christ cannot be possessed by demons. We know this is the case because John said, the wicked one toucheth him not. That's a person in whom Christ dwells. But outside of Christ, <laughs> this is the only reason it's yeah. this way. And we don't mean to make people... Uh, foolish in their reasoning or thinking, but there's some people, their condition can only be accounted for by this, that they're possessed by some foreign, foreign spirit. <clears throat> Demons. So they're intelligent, and they, have, they are possessive. They possess people by a strategy. They can overcome people. And Jesus uh, invaded their territory when he came. Yeah. Remember, he said he came to announce liberty to the captives and so forth, and that's what he was doing here. Said he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed to the devil. That, that's what he was doing here. Now these uh, spirits, a world of spirits, or demons, appear to be territorial mm -hmm. in nature. There are certain areas that they want to stay in. In Mark, fifth chapter, verse ten. Now this is this gathering demoniac. He's casting these spirits out. Mm -hmm. And they besought him much. How's that? <laughs> Some people, they just ask, they're very general in their prayers. They don't pursue <laughs> prayers. There's demons that besought Jesus much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Uh -huh. Wow, this is like a territory that they, that they had dominion over. Don't send us away from here. I have pondered for a long time, the nature of the territory where, where I presently live, which is an exceeding difficult territory to do a work for God in. How do you account for this? With so much of religion and Christianity and all this, how do you account for the fact that it's so difficult to get anybody beyond average and normal and ordinary 
How can you account for this? Now, this is my opinion, but in my opinion, this is a citadel yeah. of these spirits. Mm -hmm. They like have a domain here. They can almost break out at will. If they want to open a couple of porn shops, they can just open them up. It's just like that. Huh? If someone wants to overthrow a law about drinking, they can just overthrow it. Huh? Why? How does, how does this exist? See, there's some territories they don't want to leave. Uh -huh. uh, Jesus can make them leave. Matthew 12, 44, in this uh, parable, Jesus spoke about a evil spirit that was cast out, and he went out walking all over the place and found it very dry, and he said, I will return to my house. That was, was a person. It was a person. The house was a person. In this case, it was even a nation. It was like Israel. He said this, it was a generation to be particular. Jesus said this generation was, there are generations that Satan's had his way with. Yeah. Whole generations, huh? In 1964, in that area, there was a generation imported in here from Europe. They were called the Beatles. They brought paganism into the country. They worshipped other gods, all Buddhists and Eastern religion and mystics. They brought it in. They brought in a different kind of a music that promoted and that generation nobody good has come from that generation <laughs> you had to be delivered from that generation a whole generation mm -hmm. now we're in about the third about the third generation of that that Satan's like had free <laughs> course huh? free love remember that all started that's just when it started yeah and uh, the idea of being tolerant toward heathen religion, that's when it started. There was a generation they like captured it. You want to have power with God, that's a good thing to pray for the liberation of a generation. Yeah. I'm showing here that they are territorial in nature. If they can find a body or a geographical area they can operate with without uh, restraint, they'll they'll take it over. Mm -hmm. They'll do it. That's how you account for a whole continents. Uh -huh. Whole continents that are under the dominion of Satan. It's like he clusters in that area and just holds it captive. And only the power of God can deliver such people. Again, there's spiritual Babylon. It is mentioned in Revelation 18 2. Spiritual Babylon is Satan's fabrication of the church. It's a false church. He has a false Christ. He's called son of Antichrist, or son of perdition, but he has a erroneous Messiah that people serve. And here's what's said of Babylon, Revelation 18, 2. He cried mightily with a loud, strong voice and angels, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Demons. <laughs> See, is there, and I say this is a false church because it's pictured as a, as a harlot. A whore riding on a horse with a cup of abomination, a cup of fornication. Gee, the world is never called a harlot mm -hmm. or a whore or an adulteress. It's the false church that's called it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what spiritual Babylon is. It's an erroneous <coughs> representation of Christ. And it's a place where demons can gather. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there's a period of history when the church launched what's called the Crusades? Tremendous bloodletting. Mm -hmm. It's a blotch on the page of Christian history. Mm -hmm. How could that happen? It became the habitation mm -hmm. of demons. Yeah. That's how it could happen. Mm -hmm. How could it happen that in the name of Christ, a church could slaughter 50 million martyrs during the Dark Ages? How could that happen? A habitation of devils. Mm -hmm. That's how it could happen. Mm -hmm. Spiritual Babylon. And there was also, when Jesus was here, Galilee. This was a place in Palestine. But it had become a habitation of demons. Here's what the scripture says in Mark 1.39. Jesus preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out demons. <laughs> well, you'd think, well, in Galilee, of all places, you'd think they wouldn't be there. Well, they were there. They were there. Why? Because this it was, it was a commodious place for them to be. Truth wasn't going out from there. Mm -hmm. 
There wasn't a quest for God there. There wasn't a searching for truth there. So they just clustered there. So if a, if a church, a professed church, ever gets to the point where it's not aggressive toward the Lord, and it's not a pillar and ground of the truth, and the sound of truth isn't emitting from it, if that ever happens, guess who's going to swoop in? It's going to be these demons are going to swoop in. And God's going to let them swoop in. Because the church, uh -huh. the church without the Spirit of Christ is a shell. Yeah. That's right. It's swept and garnished, but nothing's in it. Mm -hmm. See, we're living in these kind of times, brother, I tell you. And they, as we have mentioned, can cluster in, a, they can cluster in, in one personality. The capacity of the human spirit is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why the closer you get to Christ the more intolerant you become with shallow mindedness and surface living and living by raw emotion and just a bunch of foolishness you become you become discontent with this because there's a tremendous capacity the human spirit has take for instance Mary Magdalene Jesus cast out of her seven demons and one demon could wreak havoc yeah then you have the Gadarene Demoniac, and he had a he had legion of hundreds, maybe thousands, in him. What a what a thought! Now, one other thing about uh, demons, they're behind idolatry. Now, we wouldn't know this except that Scripture makes this quite clear. Psalm 106:37. They, they they sacrifice their sons and daughters unto devils or demons. In 1 Corinthians 10.30, the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they had sacrificed to devils or to demons. They're actually receiving worship and service and adoration. This is what Satan sought to get Jesus to do. He says, fall down and worship me. Uh -huh. Well, there are people who are falling down yeah. and worshiping him. Yes. Not just Satan, but those that work under him. <laughs> They're sacrificing to him. Do you suppose there's a religion that actually goes on at focus to Satan's empire? Do you think there's such a thing? That's what it says. Now on the surface, this looks like a dignified religion. On the surface. In fact, uh, we've imported, you know, Rockefeller in, in the 60s imported foreign religions in the name of culture so we can study them. And, all of a sudden, in all of our secular schools, they had courses on these foreign religions, and you study them out. In fact, after 9-11, some of our churches started teaching Sunday school classes on the Muslim religion. What do you believe? Studying up on what the enemy thinks. Let me tell you something. You don't want to study up what the enemy thinks. Amen. You think the enemy's going to let you know what he thinks? His strategies, a secret of spiritual strength is not knowing how the enemy works, it's knowing how God works. Amen. Amen. That's the secret <laughs> The spiritual strength. It's, Amen. They're behind idolatry. They promoted false worship, false gods. And they are noted for their confession. They can, they can confess. A, a, it's true confession, but it's not a good confession. Matthew 8, 29. Jesus, thou Son of God. See, that's good too. If you say this, this is good words. They say this is not good words. True, technically true, but not good. It's coming from the wrong source. Jesus told, oh, no, don't speak anymore. And again, Mark 1 24, we know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now, this is just uh, my own opinion here. But I've wondered sometimes, do you suppose in the, it is possible in the middle of a church service someone could break out and confess Christ was a son of God, but it really wasn't coming from a pure heart, it was coming from a demon? Do you suppose such a thing is possible? Something to ponder at any rate. When you come into the congregation of the righteous, come in with your heart full of Christ and filled with the Spirit. Come in in that way. Because if you don't, there's other influences uh, that can invade the territory. Now let's, uh, let's notice the superiority of Jesus over this
horde of wicked spirits that have blind people, promote idolatry, dominate territory. So we're not talking about a weak, insipid enemy here. We're talking about something very powerful. But Jesus has absolutely no trouble, no trouble with this world of fallen spirits. No trouble at all. Matthew 8, 16 tells us, He cast out the spirits with His word. Now that's a sign of real power. Amen. If he can speak it away, that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign of real power. Now, if you want to know whether you got power, just try speaking trouble away. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people today teaching about the word of faith. They don't know what they're talking about, all right? Mm -hmm. And that faith is a creative power. They quote texts like out of the mouth, the tongue is power of life and death is in the tongue. But it's just talk. Not one of them have been able to stop the spread of sin. Not a one of them mm -hmm. in themselves, let alone in the territory they're in. Well, let me tell you, Jesus is not like this. Jesus says, when he says, go, they go. Yeah. No wrestling. Another place in Luke 11.30, he said, if I with the finger of God cast out demons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, that's a sign of real power with your finger. Just... Mm -hmm. Now, it isn't that he thrashes him with his fingers like points <laughs> with his finger. Okay, so I'm showing you that Jesus has dominion over this world of spirits that held captive humanity. There wasn't a thing they could do about it. If some of these people were possessed and they wanted to do something about it, they had to get these people to Jesus or nothing was going to be done. They brought them to Jesus. That was the only hope. And he cast them out, he said in Matthew 12, 28, he cast out demons by the Spirit of God. So he, that's another way he looks at it. With his word, with finger, by the Spirit of God. He had such a power over this domain, he could delegate the authority to his disciples mm -hmm. to do this. And I will tell you, that if he doesn't do this, there will not be anybody saying they got this yeah. if they can't do this. You get up and say, we have the power, and you just, well, just don't say it unless you can get rid of them with your word. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If you can, then speak right for it. But if you can't, just be quiet. Because it'll confuse people. Here's what the scripture says. Luke 9, 1. He called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils or demons. So these demons reacted to their word. Just like they reacted to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I will tell you that a lot of people who shout at the devil, nothing. <laughs> it takes more than a shouting at the devil. Mm -hmm. You've got to have this kind of authority. Jesus has it. There's no question about it, whether he has it or not. The question was whether we have it or not. That's the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm saying that if he could give it once, he could give it again. Amen. And it would be a refreshing welcome. <laughs> to have this kind of power come into the church to be refreshing, let me tell you. And he, uh, Jesus could rebuke. He could rebuke. When Jesus rebukes, that ends, that ends the friction. We rebuke, it can, it can keep on surfacing. <laughs> Those of you who have children, you know, if you say, be quiet, that doesn't always mean they're quiet. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. That doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to do it anymore. But when Jesus rebukes, they're quiet and they don't do it anymore. Matthew 17, 18. Jesus rebuked the demon and he departed. So he was, he, with his words, with his word. And again, Mark 9, 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and and enter no more into him. Yeah, you've got to have authority to speak like that. Isn't that a wonderful thing? <laughs> Come out and don't go in it again. Don't yeah. go in again. Now, that's authority. Jesus has authority over them. I want to draw a few conclusions about these sundry, <coughs> sundry facts. Now, Jesus at the, spent the majority of his ministry in an area called Capernaum. It says of Capernaum and Bethsaida, we're kind of twin cities, that he did most of his mighty works there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he rebuked 
He rebuked this territory because of their unbelief. Let me give you some examples. And I'm going to account for this condition of unbelief, but it was a territory dominated by Satan. Now, Jesus cast the demons out of people, but he didn't cast them out of Capernaum. That's what I want you to see. Matthew eleven twenty three. O thou Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. See, how could Jesus do such mighty works and it not affect <coughs> this territory? How could this happen? Some people believe if God would just do some mighty works here, that would change everybody's mind. If we could... Maybe just have an outbreak of divine, powerful works which some of us long to see. Yeah, legitimately so. Holy people have longed to see for God to bear his arm and work. Well, see, that does not necessarily resolve all the situations. Yes. And that's what he's showing here. Mm -hmm. He can pull people out of that quagmire and cast demons out of people. And I would suppose he could expel it from the whole territory, too, if... If this was within the province of God's will, he would do this. But he didn't do it at Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Capernaum remained under the hold of these spirits. That's why unbelief was dominating there. Luke 4.23 He said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, mm -hmm. Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. See, so they, it's like it was, it was made known what Jesus did in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. But it was under the dominion of these spirits. Luke 10, 15. Thou Capernaum, thou art exalted, shall be thrust down to hell. Let me give you another example. You remember when Jesus fed these 5,000 people beside women and children? Remember that occasion? <clears throat> was in Capernaum. That's where this happened. And it was in Capernaum. These people couldn't believe. Now I want to read that account. Look, John 6, 24. When the people saw, therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking to Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? When did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And he gives this long dissertation about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Verse 59, he said, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. Verse 66, this is Capernaum now. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Interesting. Here he did this great miracle. They came into Capernaum, a citadel mm -hmm. of Satan, and the same one that fed them taught them, and they all went home. <coughs> they all left. Why? <laughs> Under the dominion mm -hmm. of the wicked one. Now, Jesus does have total power over the enemy. He does. But when Jesus is rejected, the enemy gains power over the people. Yeah, right. And people can speculate about man's free will, and you can, uh, you're a free moral agent, and you have volitionary powers, and you can reason all you want about this. But when a person rejects Christ, when Christ holds out the scepter and says, you can come to me, and you don't come to him, you are put in a situation from which deliverance is not possible. That's what happened at Capernaum. <coughs> so these demons that he cast out of many people, where Jesus is, they can be expelled. Where Jesus isn't, they are invincible. They will not yield to the scepter of education. They will not yield to a mega church. They will not yield to scholarship. They will not yield to worldly wisdom. They will only yield 
to Christ. They will not yield to your will. They will not do it. They will yield only to Christ, but they will yield to him. <laughs> That's good news to me. That Jesus has come who has, says, I have all power in heaven and earth. I got it all. And if you will attach, so to speak, your heart's affection to Christ, this whole world of demons becomes, so to speak, and not an issue at all. It's a no issue at that point. Yeah. Because he will speak to them to leave you alone. <laughs>